Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the Government Operations Committee meeting for April 23rd, and um, we're doing this a little bit differently from how we've done Government Ops Committee meetings in the past. I think this is, uh, this is probably the first time in history we've done it this way. Um, but uh, what I'd like to do is to start off with a roll call so that we can get everybody uh, who is participating to get that recorded in the minutes. So uh, I'll ask for the perhaps the commissioners to go first, um, and then if our staff wouldn't mind doing that. So I'm uh, Andy Herod. I'm chairing the government ops committee meeting, and then if uh, commissioners would like to jump in, now's your time. Melissa Link, Tim Denson, District Five, <laughs> Patrick Davenport, District One. Okay, well, we have a quorum. Staff? Brad Griffin, Planning Department. Uh, for finance, we have David Boyd, Annette Loggins, Chris Caldwell, and I believe Jessica Berry is on the line, too. Crystal yes. Coburn, Inclusion Office. Travis Cooper, Information Technology. For Central Services, we have Andrew Saunders and Angel Hemley. I'm Sherry Hines uh, from the Attorney's Office. And Michael Penn from the Attorney's Office. <coughs> John yeah, everybody. And Doug John Hanford, Spanier. Building Inspection Department Director. Sorry, I was muted. Perfect. And then uh, Josh Edwards uh, from the manager's office. I think that's everybody. And everybody's audio is working great. So we're good to go. Okay. Um, all right. So what I'd like to do first thing is to approve the minutes uh, of our last meeting, which was held on February the 20th, um, 2020. So do I have a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move. Okay. Second. Do I have a second? Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, so the minutes are approved for our February 20th meeting. Um, so we have uh, the next item on our uh, agenda for this evening is I think to finish up discussion of our uh, leasing policy for a a ACC properties. Um, we had discussed this over last uh, two or three meetings, I believe. And um, uh, Assistant Manager Edwards, do you want to um, pick up the ball on this and get us rolling down the hill? Yeah, so as you all requested last meeting, you wanted us to fine tune a couple of items and then send it back out for you all review. Andrew and Andrew are both ready to walk through those changes uh, and address any other items you all have. But I think we're real close to this, uh, this one being done. Okay. All right. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen with you and we'll look at the policy that should have been shared with you ahead of time. So give me one second. Um, okay. Can everybody see this? Yes. Perfect. Uh, in the last meeting, we reviewed some of the updates that were incorporated at your request that included things like a um, income cap, unifying leases under a common leasing term, which would run consistent with our fiscal year, um, and incorporating more structure and a community benefits agreement. Um, at the last meeting, you asked us to kind of create a punch list around a few things that included um, a little more detail about income qualified properties, a better understanding of wear and tear and, and what the cost recovery process would look like, um, and then a little additional detail on the community benefits agreement. So what I have on this screen is the policy and I've highlighted some of the new sections. This first one is under the ability to pay clause. So the entire nonprofit uh, leasing policy is under the architecture of these two clauses. One of them relates to the independent agency funding that we've discussed. 
And the other relates around ability to pay, where we are saying that uh, it's the policy of this body that uh, a public space lease account for no more than 25% of average annual income. And so for established entities, that's pretty straightforward, but we talked about, well, what if this is like a new nonprofit on the scene and, and this may be used to um, uh, help get, get them off the ground. And so I've added in some language, or we've added in some language around this. And what we really did is we talked about a signed affidavit um, and a couple things happened there. So they would project what they think their three-year income would look like. Um, we would set the lease at that. But then after that three years, so instead of having a standard one-year lease renewable for four that most of our folks use, if you're coming in under this clause, you would have one year renewable for two. And then at the end of the three years, that would come back before the commission. And at that point, if you wanted to qualify under income, you could use the income statements that you had. Um, before I move on to the next changes, is there any question about that? Okay, hearing none. Um, we talked a little bit about accelerated wear and tear and uh, normal wear and tear. And so, first of all, I just want to be clear that uh, cost recovery for wear and tear is not the norm of this government. Uh, right now, we have one facility where that's done. It is a facility where the lease rate is set at a dollar, and it is a um, high-use facility that just recently started to house a... Uh, women's rehabilitation dormitory. Um, so there's two things that this says. It says that under certain conditions, we may seek accelerated wear and tear, but if we were gonna do that, it would have to be identified at the time the lease is established and approved by the mayor and commission. And that the, the conditions under which we might seek wear and tear would generally fall under these zoning uses or, or, or property uses from the zoning code. And what I did is I broke it down uh, into three columns based on the amount of use. So when we think about these facilities, it's both the type of the facility and then how many hours per week that we might see um, this facility used. And so uh, what we do is it can, right now with the particular um, entity that we have a cost recovery with is we set it based on our actual costs. So um, what it cost us to respond with maintenance, what it cost us to do preventative maintenance at the site, and then what some of our capital cost would be. Um, so what this is saying is that if you were going to be doing a dormitory and it was going to be 24 hours a day that we might try to recover between half and 100 percent of those costs incurred by the government. Um, on the other hand, if you were doing that where it's just an overnight facility, well, we might not attempt to recover cost at all. So this does, I just want to be clear, it does open up uh, the door to commission discretion. Of course, the commission has discretion on anything it wants. Um, so that's why I've tried to put structure in it. You know, we're not going to come to you on a on an eight hour a day facility and um, tell you that because you're going to use the site for food service that we hundred percent of your cost. But in theory, you could have one restaurant that is set at 25 and a different commission could set the next one at 20 or 10 or whatever. And so I just want to make that, you know, identify that weakness here. Um, and then on, based on your request in a similar manner, we also put in a definition of normal wear and tear. And I took this actually right out of the Georgia Landlord Tenant Handbook. Uh, now that focuses on residential property, but still it just talks about um, deterioration from the intended use of the facility, not associated with negligence, carelessness, or abuse of the property. So it's going to be things like scuffed walls, carpet, tack holes. Um, it's, it, but it's not going to be, you know, a, a two square foot punch out in the drywall, a, a torn up 
you know, flooring and, and tile, that kind of thing. So um, if you all choose to incorporate this, what would happen in the, the leasing policy is we would look to this as a guideline. We would try to check against, you know, what is the additional cost to the government to have this type of use? And then there would be a recommendation brought to the commission on what cost recovery could look like. Um, before I move on, are there questions about that? Thank you, Saunders. I just got one question, um, yes, and it's on three accelerated wear and tear. Mm -hmm. Maybe because I'm reading this too hard, or I, maybe it's wordsmithing. Um, ACC may seek to partially recover maintenance contributions. Um, can you explain what partially recover maintenance contribution? Well, I think you have just identified a. Uh, uh a potential typo because if you look in this okay. column here, we may seek to fully recover. Um, yeah. So uh, that we might want to change that one word. But the idea is is that for the majority of uses of our facilities, wear and tear, even slightly beyond normal, is expected. We're thinking about the types of uses that accelerate the need to replace HVAC units, that change our, our flooring from a 10-year cycle to a five-year cycle, that um, may have children that are especially hard on drywall and paint cycles. These are the types of costs that, um, that, that really carry for our department and for our staff. Um, Obviously, when you start to get into 24 hour a day or 16 hour a day uses, we're much more likely to have a uh, after hours response for clogged plumbing or so on. And so with that, uh, our department incurs overtime to mobilize that staff. Um, so again, this is a, these are this is a framework. It is not obligating. You, we absolutely, you know, for example, could have a clinic that runs 24 hours a day and uh, the governing body says, well, the, the you know, it, it recommends a minimum of 25, but we choose to set it at zero. But I do think it would be very bizarre if we had a commission come forward and say, well, we have a clinic that operates 24 hours a day and staff have recommended 25% cost recovery, but we want a hundred, you know, that's, like, there's meant to be an upward cap there, not a, not a necessarily a lower cap. Um, so, but because it could extend, it could get on these really more, uh, heavy wear and tear uses, uh, perhaps we could strike the word partially from this and just say it, they may seek to recover maintenance contributions. Is everybody okay with that? I think so. Yes, I'm okay with it. Yeah. Okay, why don't we do that then? Um, going down, so that's the end of the policy. Everything else you, you'll see is just meant to be uh, informative of the, uh, the application of the policy. So one of the items I added is because this is a um, fairly complicated animal that combines the building type, the building cost, and uh, location and then also factors in things about the building occupant as it relates to their ability to pay and whether or not they're receiving agency funding. I thought I would go ahead and we could lay out the basic building cost um, of spaces we commonly lease. So these are places that are currently under lease um, and it identifies their square footage and, and takes those building related factors and just says, you know, if you were a nonprofit tenant that was coming in here and you had no other factors in which you wanted to apply, this would be the base cost. But it also says down here, there's a way that you can come, you can reduce that cost to a dollar. There's a way that that cost can come down to a 25% reduction. There are these basically all of these factors around how you use the facility. So it is completely plausible. I mean, for an example here, the library, if you were to think of it as a, uh, uh, a purely commercial facility, 
we could rent it out as office space for a, a, a nice premium is what the market has told us. But we're not in the market business. We're in the uh, educating the community and providing uh, social services business. And so we already give the library significant independent agency funding. And so as a result, they get to use that facility for a dollar or effectively no fee. Um, but I just felt it was wise to put this in here so that it's easy for folks to just know if somebody calls up and says, hey, what does the Brumby house rent for? Well, we could say, well, the, the most you would pay is $56,000, but there are other factors that could apply to bring that rate down. Um, and then, under the, sorry, are there questions about that? I have a, a question, and it, this is something that just occurred to me the other night when I was thinking about this, with the rental income. Yeah. Um, the 10% annual lease rate is applied to tenants wishing to generate revenue from space rentals. The revenue from those rentals vastly differs. I mean, you might have a facility that, that rents out a community room for, you know, 10 or $20 an hour, you know, a couple, maybe once every week or two versus a facility that's basically exists to be rented out for large expensive events. Um, I kind of wonder if we shouldn't put a clause in there that somehow, I mean, maybe, maybe a, a cut of the, of the rental fees or something, um, because it just, I, I'm not sure it seems fair. Like you could have a facility that's, has a pretty high lease rate and rents once in a while, but doesn't generate a whole lot of income from that rental. See what I'm saying? I do. Um, and I personally wondered about that myself. Um, what uh, I wanted to be careful of here is, uh, it, it was this body that asked that rental be considered. And if we go to a cost share model, we end up with a, um, we end up putting a significant burden on staff to try to identify and recover those costs. Um, could we, I'm just trying to think of how this could work without having to track every single rental. Um, could we ask for an annual report of the percentage of their income that comes from the rental and, and base that lease rate on that? Anybody you, have any input on this? Yes, perhaps it should be a income sharing model uh, for the rent. Maybe it's 10% of the rent, 15% of the rent. Uh, it's something that the, the leaser, uh, the leasee, <laughs> the, whoever rented the building uh, can then, if they want to, they can add that to what they need for the rental. But it has to be something reasonable. So maybe yeah, it's ten percent uh, uh, rental sharing. It just doesn't seem fair to think that you know something like the Miriam Moore Center rents out a community room for pocket change once in a while, um, you know, and they get the same ten percent increase that say, you know, but the it, it, Grady it, House gets for renting out every single weekend. I'm sorry, so 10% 10 of the rent income. So if they well, it once a year, it's 10% of that one rental. Is It's the lease rate increase. It's not based on the amount of the rental, right, Andrew? No, I, what I'm saying is let's make it based on the amount of rental. That's what I'm thinking too. Yeah. Or or maybe, maybe to make it a little bit easier because I think that that would be extremely difficult for us to have to have staff tracking every rental that they do which could be multiple per month and they're all differing rates sometimes or something maybe more so we, we put in place a uh, a range that if your rental fees are up to this point then you get that but if your rental range is like like you said for the miriam moore center it's pretty cheap but the grady center they're making hundreds of dollars um so maybe that would be a different a different increase there. 
So uh, uh, I like that. I would also suggest that you could tier it by building size and just do a flat fee. You know, if you were going to rent, I'm looking at the size of our common rental spaces here. So if you were going to rent a space that is under 3,500 square feet, maybe it's a one-time or a, an annual fee of $400 or $300. If you were going to rent something that's under 20,000 square feet on a regular basis, it's $1,000. You, you could do that. Um, because I think you're correct. The reality is, is that as we see this, there are a couple of major renters and only one major revenue generator. We know the library will rent you a community room for next to nothing. And many times, if it's a public service, it is nothing. We know that the uh, old fire hall two, two, that is available for rent. And it is also, I, I believe, incidental to their use of the building. And we know that Taylor Grady House, it is their principal use of the building. Um, and so if you were to have a straight 10% fee, you could see somebody like Fire Hall 2 just quit making that space available because they say, well, it's not worth it to us to try to pay this increase in rent. Um, now, for the library, it's it's not going to matter because we're still at a dollar. But that that is something to consider is maybe just a tiered flat rate structure. Um, I kind of wonder if if we should look at it as um, rental income versus the, the the amount of rental income generated versus the amount of their of their lease. Um, like what percentage? of their rental income revenue compare the two like how high is your lease and how high is your rental if your rental income is a meager fraction of your lease maybe we don't penalize you at all or you know um but if it's a, a pretty significant portion if it if it equals or goes above that lease amount um you know maybe we restructure that lease well if we did it if we just said that it's going to be a percentage of your of your rental income and then we subjected them to a possible audit to look at their books and see what their rental income is and make sure that they paid it uh you know i think we we have to have a little trust here but trust but verify if you will yeah I don't, it doesn't it be declared at the outset of the lease i mean everybody submits their 501c fours <laughs> Um, whatever the documentation is for, for their nonprofit status, and they would have to declare that revenue, that rental income revenue, I, I presume. Yeah. Well, unless they haven't used the facility in that way previously. Um, but I do think it could be this simple. We could ask, uh, you're kind of following around Commissioner Neesmith's uh, suggestion here is we could ask uh, at the time of the lease and even put in the lease whether or not they intend to use the space for fee-based rentals. If they do, we can ask them at the end of the year kind of that true up and we can say like, if you're gonna use it, there's a 8% or 10% cost share. And then they can incorporate that into their rental rates if they need to. Exactly. We can at the end of the year say, okay, how much did you rent? Uh, we, you know, we're, we're ready for our cost share. And then we could just have in this document and in the lease that we reserve the right, but not the obligation to audit. Right. Uh, like and so, you know, if, if, if the Taylor Grady house tells you that they're making 60 K, we may not be worth our while to go audit. If the fire hall two tells you they made 300 bucks. It also may not be worth our while to go audit it. It's just going to be kind of what, what do we observe versus um, what do we see? And then also with nonprofits, their tax records become public record uh, through ProPublica. Pro yeah. So there's also the, a pretty simple check you can do there. Um, I wonder I wonder if we could, uh, be, again, going back to, uh, if we're just being honest here, oh, like you said, only one of these entities are we really talking about bringing in uh, exceptional revenue. And I don't want, with our attempt to make sure that that one is held accountable, I don't want us to be 
inadvertently adding extra cost onto the other ones that, like you said, Andrew, are for the most part uh, offering community services here. So maybe if we, if we write that into the lease, we could have some kind of clause that's like, if your room rentals are $25 or less, something like that, then you are exempt from this clause or something like that. Because again, I don't, last thing I want to do is like all of a sudden we just add on an extra three bucks or something on to renting out uh, a community room from the firehouse or something like that. That's why I think maybe we should look at it as um, rental revenue being a certain percentage of the, the um, market rate lease. Um, you know, the preliminary cost of the lease, you know, we, we said we have this market rate lease and then we start chopping away at it with these other factors. Maybe this could be one of the factors. And there's well, less chopping away. You're you're actually generating significant amount of revenue in proportion to the overall worth of the lease. That makes sense. <laughs> a couple a couple of points. Um, one, whether you make this a ten percent add-on or a ten percent discount, if you don't, you might be chopping away, but it's the same outcome, um, which is implying additional charge based on the total size of the facility because you chose to rent it. Well, um, we, we could also put a, uh, a floor on their rental income before we take our 10%. I, I, would, I would support that. As, so say, as, for example, if your rental is per year exceed, I don't know, pick a number, $1,000, $2,000, then you're subject to uh, the revenue sharing. That way we don't hurt guys that are fire, a firehouse community room rents for $15 a day. You know, take a lot of money, a lot of rentals to get that up above a thousand or so dollars. I definitely think some kind of floor would make sense. The other thing that is probably worth pointing out is the one major facility here that currently generates income from rental. Um, this one. We started that facility cost. I mean, this reflects the market rate for that facility if we were going to put it into the private sector. Well, if you put it in the private sector, they have the right to rent it. You know, if I if I rent an office space, more often than not, I can have people pay to come have a cubicle or have an event. So because we started with market rates, there's this. In this particular facility, the only way they're bringing this rent down is to either um, qualify as income qualified to receive independent agency funding in which that particular organization does not, or to uh, have a community benefits agreement where they have to come back to this body and justify why the services provided there uh, are 80% lease reduction. So, I don't, I don't know that, I think first of all, there's a, there's a, there's a potential here that this particular facility that generates revenue off of rentals almost exclusively um, is, is already going to probably end up being an income qualified facility because we haven't seen any of their tax returns. I mean, that's 130% of their average income. Um, this, so having this rental clause really has done nothing to to account for that. Um, the other is I, I do like having a floor of like if you're you know if your rental income is less than twenty five hundred a year we just don't care because um, then I I just hesitate to invest what could amount to hundreds of dollars of staff time chasing down dozens of dollars in revenue share. Mm -hmm. This discussion, I think we've covered the bases. What is your recommendation? I recommend you just drop it. Um, drop it just forget about it. Huh? I, I don't think there should be a, a penalty for people that use the facility because I think it's going to it's going to show itself in a community benefits agreement. And if you weren't going to drop it, then I would say. Um, maybe a hybrid between your recommendation and Commissioner Denson's where it says 
if you rent the facility for less than X dollars a day or make less than X dollars of income per year, we don't care if it's more than that, then we're going to do a cost share with you. I, I like that idea of, uh, you know, setting a floor and then, you know, reserving the right to take a closer look if you go above that floor and exploring if there needs to be a, a cost share. I think if they go above that floor, then then, then it's up to them to uh, start paying. And I call it a revenue share rather than a cost share. Yeah. And so um, would you all be willing to throw out some consensus on what you think the floor should be? I like your number, $2,500. Okay. I would, yeah. I, would, I would maybe suggest going up a little bit. Um, mainly because the other one I see possibly getting caught up in this is the library, who for their auditorium, yeah, I believe it's a hundred dollars rental fee. Okay. Um, and I'm just thinking, probably on average they rent that out like three times a month. That puts us at like thirty six hundred dollars. Um, so maybe, I guess that's the number I'd throw out. Thirty six hundred. Right. I have no problem with that. Okay. That's three hundred dollars. And so, what this will modify from then is instead of being a uh, uh, increase to the lease rate, we will just have a clause in here that says, when facility rentals exceed thirty six hundred dollars a year, there is a ten percent cost share. Let's call it income. A revenue share. Yeah, revenue share. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay, and then the last item is um, under the Community Benefits Agreement, uh, Angel has researched quite a few of these and, and has, you all gave feedback of you didn't want to bait people into what we wanted to hear. You wanted to give them a, a, a structure in which to sell their benefit to the community and then um, the commission would take this up independently. And so this is the general structure of the agreement as you would see it. It would talk about the facility, who's renting it, what's their mission. Uh, so one of the things we added is we took the goals and aligned them with the, um, the current budgetary goals of the commission. We also asked, well, what, what, how are we going to justify success? If, if you say shared prosperity is about jobs training, is that two people per year, 50 people? What does that look like? Um, and then the other thing that would be useful for the commission to see uh, that I will be added in is how much is the value of this? Are they, does this qualify them for a $4,000 a year reduction or an $80,000 per year reduction? And uh, what is the what is the expectation that this the, the lessee who's agreed to this, how do they report to us and, and show that they're progressing towards those goals? Any questions or comments about that? Did you give an answer to that question? What do you mean, did we give an answer? No, did you? I heard you ask questions, but I'm not sure I heard what the answer was. What is the value? Uh, no, that's that's what uh, it would depend by facility. Yeah, they're making the case for it, and then y'all are deciding whether that's a fair value. I yeah, see. I see. So basically, you would use the information from items three, four, five, six, and seven to justify if you wanted to offer the reduction from section eight. Okay. Sounds like we need a commission rental committee, huh? <laughs> Andrew, that's a good question in terms of when this will go into effect. Uh, just some dates we want to put out there. The, the next rentals uh, that need to be updated are, are coming as of July 1st. And so we are trying to line everything on the fiscal year now. And so if we're going to get this in front of the full mayor and commission, we need to have this ready for the next agenda setting meeting. So it can be approved before uh, July 1. Uh, I, I don't know what mechanism y'all want to use for those first ones, 
But Andrew, what what's that turnaround time to for them to you think to fill this out and, and give information? And will there be enough enough time in your in your opinion? Well, Angel, I would ask you: Can you hop on and remind me which lessees are currently up for renewal? Yeah, it'll be all the Miriam Moore. Okay. And um, the um, neighborhood health center. Okay. And I think that is it. Got my list here. That's easy. Yeah, those are coming up July one. But um, yeah, let's see. Henderson Extension, the Miriam Moore facility. Yeah, that's that's all that's coming up July one. But if we get the agenda report, and it's not going to be when would it be approved in June? It would be up for vote on that 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 uh, voting meeting in June. Mm -hmm. I honestly, I mean, I've worked with these tenants a long time, and I don't think I would be able to get everything I need to get them started on July one. That's my opinion. <laughs> um, but I mean, we did put in the policy that it could be for the first year could be for less than a year. Right. That it would just still expire at the same time every year. Or or we could share the changes in advance and, and let them know how it's probably going to change so they can start before uh, conceivably. Yes. If we could do that. Be. Yeah. Yeah. That would be, I mean, that would give us more time. Yeah. Well, there's another opportunity here which is, um, this is gonna be a pretty big change in policy in both directions. You're gonna see entities that have historically paid be available to a reduction, and you're gonna see entities that have historically leased for a dollar have an expectation to pay. What, what could be done is we could continue to hold leases at a dollar for this coming fiscal year. Um, and go ahead and let them know this is the adopted policy. These are the terms. And whether your lease renews next year or not, we intend, you know, the automatic renewals are only automatic to the degree both parties agree. So you could basically, we could use this to telegraph what the new policy is and give those individuals opportunities to come and talk with us and understand this and spend some time working on a community benefits agreement if they want to go that way. And then it would effectively go into uh, application as far as applying new rents into the FY22 cycle. Let me tell you why, let me tell you why I particularly like that. It's because of what we're going through right now. And I think that the amount of that they're going to have on July 1st is very, uh, up in the air. So I think I think giving a year to roll this in is, is a very prudent thing to do. Well, also, this is kind of what we had talked about, uh, I think, at our last meeting, which was that, you know, for some organizations, they're, go they're going to see an increase um, and that, you know, we wanted to basically um, phase that in. For the ones that are going to see a decrease, I don't see that they're going to want to hold off. But for the ones that are going to see an increase they probably need some time to um you know figure out how they're going to address that get it into their budget and everything so we had that i forget whether it was at our february or january meeting now but we had talked about um rolling this in so i i think it's reasonable to let the let everybody know what's coming down the pike um for those that are likely to see an increase to give them a year to um, come up with a way of addressing that. Whereas for those that would see a decrease, I'm sure that they won't have any problem wanting to sign on on July the 1st. Um, I have a question. This is Angel. I have a question, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, one thing is like the cottage, the um, cottage, the sexual assault center. Their current lease doesn't expire until 2027 because we gave them, I think it was um, a 10 year lease at the time because they put a lot of money into the facility. So would this take effect for them next year too? Or are we going to let their current lease roll on until 2000, 
and 27. I think if we have a lease with somebody at the moment, probably legally, we have to maintain that lease until it ends, I should imagine. I'm, I'm not an attorney, but okay. that's quite certainly true. Okay. Well, are they on the dollar thing too, though? That, that would have altered the lease. If, did the cottage go to that also? Uh, they were already on a dollar before this took dollar. place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So right, right now, uh, Angel, correct me if I'm wrong, Basically, nobody is paying except for the parking, uh, downtown parking. Right. The, the modern age, the smoke shop in the parking deck. Which, I mean, they're public or private sector. So, I mean, that's a, a, that's a covered and just market rate section. Um, right. So, you, what you really are talking about, because when this problem was identified, the commission took the action to uh, set. Oh, I'm sorry. We also do charge rent at the um, West Broad Service Center facility, but, but that lessee does not pay it. Um, so they're effectively at a dollar. Um, so you are actually going to see, as a result of enacting this policy, a couple of things. Historically, these individuals at the Miriam Moore Center have paid. They were used to paying. They were set to a dollar when this problem was identified. Some of them will go back to paying, but it will be a system that is fair where everybody is playing under the same rules and they will have opportunities to get further rent reductions than what's even shown in this column. So I think really as far as holding the lease extensions for a year or anybody that's renewing and just saying, Hey, you're going to get it for one year for a dollar. And here's the policy for next year. You're not harming anybody and you're by artificially holding them at a, a higher rate. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that another good reason this might, that might be a good move. And this kind of goes back to commissioner Neesmith's comments. If we did that, that would kind of line up all of the renewals to happen in the same period. Because as I look at this, well, it's not necessarily a ton of work for the commission. It's a sizable amount. And I feel like it's going to be a lot easier if we we're going through and hitting all of these at once. We could have a special session set up kind of like we do the board authority and commissions where we sit down and evaluate these things and then give our recommendations out of it. And I think it'd be a lot easier if we we're doing that, all of those in like a one day session than having to do one or two different ones every month and a half. I also think that if you're taking them on all at the same time, it's much more likely that everybody uh, gets the same treatment, which has been one of the problems that kicked us off is we had a lot of legacy agreements and, and items of that nature. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think we've got consensus okay so basically just to summarize um this document uh we're pretty happy with the document itself and what we are talking about is um that this probably wouldn't go into actual effect until july of 2021 but we're going to give um all of the um, entities a heads up that this will be the new policy coming down the pike and that they need to um, prepare for that. Is that basically what I'm hearing? Is everybody on the same page? I think so. Yeah. Okay. That's what I recall with, with that discussion about the rent revenue floor. The yeah, where did we end up on that? What I heard is I was going to, well, sorry, please. Uh, what I heard is that we were going to remove the modifying factor uh, as a part of rent. And we were just going to add a standing clause that if uh, rents of a facility were to exceed $3,600 a year, there would be a, a revenue share of 10%. Yeah. Okay. Is everybody happy with where we're at then? I am. Yeah. Jim, Melissa. Yep. yep. That makes sense. Pat Patrick. Yes, sir. 
Okay, do we have a motion to move this on to the full commission then? So moved. I'll second. We, all right, we have a, 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 a firster and a seconder. Uh, any further discussion? No. Nope. If not, everybody in favor, please say aye. 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 Everybody, anybody opposed? Okay, so I will move that on to the full commission and then I'm assuming either Josh or Andrew or someone will put the report together. Good, good. Um, Andrew. Thank you. Yes, good job. All yeah, right, so the second thank thing you. we were going to talk about was the review of our short-term rentals. Um, we did have a presentation about this at a previous meeting. Um, so, Josh, do you want to pick us up from where we dropped off? Yes, and we'll we'll start by answering a couple of the follow-up questions y'all had asked. I do want to to note that the world has changed drastically since we last talked about this, and this is one of those areas uh, that I think potentially has changed. But as staff, what we wanted to make sure we did was present the work we had done uh, in preparation for what was going to be the March meeting of the GOC, uh, and we ended up canceling that for obvious reasons. Uh, and we want to present what we have. We also want y'all to know that uh, some of this work uh, potentially is going to change. Uh, the, the revenue estimates are all based on on kind of previous uh, previous experience uh, that we probably won't see, uh, and you know it, we're un, we're unlikely to see the number of rentals uh, for the near term. Uh, but in general, I'm gonna I'm just going to show uh, uh, an a. Uh, Part of the presentation we gave you last time, just to, to, to double back and answer one of the questions to start. Uh, so what you're seeing now uh, is, let's put this into presentation mode, is a portion of the presentation we gave last meeting. And we wanted to answer, uh, I believe it was Commissioner Neesmith's question in terms of a, a recommendation from staff on what modules we would recommend if we were to purchase a software platform. Uh, and the quick answer to that is we believe we, we would need every module of staff. Uh, and so uh, without you know current employees to do this work, this would be a, an add-on and the, the need for a hotline, the need for uh, compliance monitoring would be there in, in year one. Uh, and just to remind you all of the cost, uh, we did, uh, uh, Travis is on the, on the, on the WebEx, uh, he did reach out and try to find other companies that do this work to get estimates, to get a sense on if this was a normal rate. Uh, there aren't a ton out there that we could find. And because the total cost is 66000 we automatically need to do an RFP anyway. So our recommendation as staff uh, would be that if you don't want to go down this road, uh, we would do an RFP and we would see who's in this in this round and we would bring back uh, and do demos of, of and do a full evaluation. So that, that would be our recommendation uh, in terms of uh, next steps. But that... You're on. You're on mute, Josh. I wanted to uh, see if y'all had any questions uh, about the cost and the, the potential RFP before moving on to other items. So, so just to remind uh, everybody, this is to um, work with an entity that will help us to collect taxes that people should be paying, but with the exception of a very small number, are not presently. Paying is that correct? That is correct. Let me okay. let me add, let me add some new information to this. I got a notice from Airbnb last week that they were now required to collect taxes on on short term rentals in Georgia. Hmm. The hotel motel tax? No, uh, probably just sales tax. They didn't sales really. Tax? They really didn't say. And, and uh, if I can speak really quickly. Yeah, I'm handing off to you, Sherry. Yeah, yeah so so that's um, HB 276, which went into effect April 1st, and that is sales tax. Um, the statute, uh, or excuse me, the proposed bill for hotel motel is HB 448, 
And that is still pending. The last activity on that was March 13th. Read and referred, so it hasn't um, hasn't done anything in a while. So we're watching that, and, and one of the things that finance and I've talked about is that it would be really interesting to see what happens. Sherry, you're going in and out a little bit. If you oh, don't sorry, mind. can you hear me better this That's way? That's much better. Okay, I apologize. Um, but but the short version is that HB 448, if it passes, is what would give us the um, Hotel motel. Give the the marketplace uh, facilitators the authority to collect those hotel motel fees, um, and then uh, there's another bill that's out there, HB five twenty three, that would really curtail our ability to regulate these. So that's another one we're watching. So from what I read in the paper, there was some discussion that the general assembly may not come back into session until June sometime. Um. And uh, so, you know, whatever uh, gets voted on may not end up being signed by the governor until who knows when, July, maybe. I don't know. Um, I can tell you there's not a lot of short-term rentals going on right now. Yeah. So no, but there's, funny. but there's also not a lot of activity going on in the General Assembly either. Yeah, I understand, but... Um, should we put this on hold until yeah. the General Assembly I goes think so. through everything and, and the market kind of restabilizes, see where I we think. are in, say, the fall? I think so. Well, I, was was I was going to ask Josh, if we were to do an RFP, what, I mean, what's the time frame for that anyway? 90 days, 120 days? Yeah, I, I would say it's about that time frame. I think the, the big question there is without, you know, current funding for that in the budget, uh, we would then have to do a, a you know, a, a follow-up agenda item asking for the money mid-year. Uh, so that's adding some time to it as well. So it would be a little bit longer than your typical RFP, but Travis, is that about right? Yes, that would be about right. Well, I, I think also that, uh, you know, our own budget setting is going to be uh, pretty nasty. I don't know that if we want to obligate ourselves, or RFP does not obligate us, but to obligate ourselves to spend that money uh, at this time. Yeah, I mean, all I, all I was thinking is that, it, you know, we might, nothing's going to happen for a while, and, and I get that, um, but it might not be a bad idea to at least know who's out there that we might be dealing with, and one way to do that is perhaps through an RFP. But. Yeah, yeah, good point. Good point. I, I agree with Andy here. I mean, I understand that we're kind of on a whole pattern because of the legislation and the market, but the RFP process requires that hold pattern anyways. Yeah. So why not move forward whenever, especially with the RFP, we're not necessarily beholden to have to enforce it. Mm -hmm. Why not just go ahead and do this work now that we are probably going to have to do eventually? Yeah. So if I could interrupt for just a minute, this is Jessica Berry, the purchasing administrator. Um, you're right in that you can do the RFP process and, and it takes a little bit of time to do so. But we also have another mechanism out there. Um, it's called an RFI, so it's a request for information. It would allow you to gather more information without having any budgetary information for that. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. I like that. <laughs> that's what I used to do is do RFIs with you learn you learn things so maybe if y'all want to give us a, a time frame to shoot for for us to bring something back that's that's kind of the go-do for us on this item well you tell us when, when, when I mean presumably an RFI would be a, 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 a quicker activity than the RFP or yeah. am I misunderstanding that would be no that is correct so i don't know 60 days does that sound reasonable sure thing uh and uh i know the rest of the finance team is there was there anything y'all wanted to bring up uh on this item and I, I know we we provided the full goc uh, uh revenue estimate uh and i don't know if y'all want us to share that real quick before moving on uh, i think our big asterisk on that is this is pre-covid 19 and so uh we're we're recognizing this might not be uh, that useful at this point, uh, and I think that's another reason, really, to 
to wait until we have an RFI, but I'm just going to put it up on the screen in case y'all have any questions or in case the finance team wants to share anything. That's fine. Chris, do you want to, you want to run through this real quick? Um, yeah, just real quickly, the, um, uh, just to try to get a rough estimate. And again, as Josh mentioned, this was, um, pre COVID-19, um, uh, tried to look at a couple of sources to get an idea about number of units, average nightly rate and occupancy rate. Um, the host compliance information provided some of that. Uh, the House Bill 448 that Sherry talked about, the uh, lodging facilitators tax, their, their fiscal note also did some estimating to see that impact statewide. So there was some assumptions in there and uh, and then there are also another firm, uh, Air DNA. It doesn't. It's not like host compliance. It does collections, um, but is uh, more on the investor side, I think. Um, so so anyway, use those three sources to kind of get an idea of of um, a range. And um, you can see that um, uh, if um, you know, sort of a low range there, right in the middle. Uh, it says net hotel motel taxes, uh, really probably should say gross, but uh, anywhere from 600,000 or so um, and up. Um, estimating, you know, the, the cost again that Josh touched on earlier using the host compliance as an estimated cost for outsourcing the, the collection uh, of that about 66,000. Even using that, we still would probably have some staff costs um, and thinking about it that way if we have anywhere from you know 500 to 600 um, returns a month for paying hotel motel um, we still need staff to handle that um, to answer questions provide information and a lot of this will be to individuals that you know that uh, you know aren't like our regular hotels uh, so, so would anticipate some staff cost. Um, so gives you sort of a, a net hotel motel tax cost there anywhere from 500,000 to possibly to me. And again, pre COVID-19, uh, just a reminder there, six of the seven cents, uh, currently goes to the classic center and CVB. Uh, so six of seven cents of any new. Uh, coming in would um, would go there, um, and then you can see the balance at the end. So, just a quick um, uh, again, it's hard to tell um, over the next six nine months how um, lodging comes back. So this is a uh, again not current circumstance, but prior. Um. Let me just mention this, just in case people don't know it. Uh, something I learned is that the hotel, the five dollar hotel motel fee, which is a state fee, uh, only applies to uh, rentals that have five or more units. So the the fee is not being going to be collected. Um, I, had a, I had a question. Uh, I guess or just an idea thrown out there too. Um, so especially since. Uh, such a large percent of this is committed to Classic Center and the CVB. Uh, is there any way that we, any way that we could uh, share some of the staff costs, if nothing else, uh, with Classic Center and the CVB? Of course, we're getting we're getting the sales tax. Well, yeah, no, I know, but still, like, what, I'm just wondering if there, if there. I mean, I know that already the CVB already does. Has some stuff they do they do with a hotel with that whole uh, pool that they use now. I don't know. Well, the other thing is, I maybe I'm misremembering, but I, I seem to recall that we had a discussion about the um, five out of the six or six out of the seven pennies or whatever it is versus um, a, a set amount that we gave to the classic center. Um, in which case, um, depending on what happens with the economy, which isn't, look, isn't looking very good right now, um, 
it may be that we could actually end up having more money go to the to the classic center and CVB, but actually as a, a provider, a fewer number of pennies out of that percentage. Am I mis am I misremembering that discussion, Josh? I I think we we touched on that. I don't know how much detail we got into it, but I would I would ask the the finance team to clarify if you can. Yeah, the current currently the agreement with the Classic Center and CVB is they get six or seven cents up to the budget amount. Okay. So, um, so you know if it's less than that budget, they're going to get six of seven. But once it reaches that budget amount, then um, they're capped. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's currently how it's uh, set up. Okay. So it is possible, depending on what happens with the economy, that that um, we could generate more than this 78000 uh, which is the low end, give the classic sender and CVB everything that they're committed to, and it not be six out of seven pennies, or six out of seven percent. Is that correct? Yes. Yep, that's correct. I think okay. the next thing to remember too is if we do to move on this next year, we'd be recognizing whatever that revenue estimate is. So obviously the low number here, right? We we could recognize that new revenue, which would then cover the software platform, depending on what the cost on that mm -hmm. was as well. Okay. So we do that all as part of one agenda item. And, and staff. Right. The additional mm -hmm. staff. So that kind of Tim, tell me if you disagree, but that kind of takes away the argument of doing cost sharing. Uh, with CVB and Classic Center because they're going to hit a ceiling. Uh, if we do cost sharing, we're going to have to raise their ceiling. Yeah, I mean, it, this wasn't as much of a thing idea of just like, I just thought they might have some resources that could be helpful with us on this that could lower the ultimate costs. I mean, something yeah. we we'll always be exploring if that's possible. Yeah. Well, I think for the time being, though, you know, we're again, maybe we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. I mean, I think at the moment we're just talking about a a sending out a request for information as to um, what it would cost us to do this, what various different um, companies that do this kind of thing, what they could provide us. Um, yeah. So, I'm you know, maybe if we if we stick to that conversation at the moment, wait and see what they come back with you know, 90 or 120 days down the road, we may have a better idea of what's going to be happening. I mean, one of the big things is, is there going to be a football season this year? Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. Ready to, we, we have no idea. I'm ready to make a motion you know, have to bring us back a, a draft RFI. Sorry, say that again, Jerry, you faded out. Sorry. I'm ready to make a motion to ask staff to bring us back a draft RFI. Okay. Is there a second? I second. Okay. All right. Is there any more discussion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody aye. opposed? Aye. All right. So is that clear then, Josh? We got it. Thanks for the okay. guidance. All right. So um, now we normally only go for about an hour. Uh, we're at an hour and 10 minutes or so right now. Um, do we? I think we're just going to get a quick report on the home occupations. Is that correct? Yeah, the next two we're prepared to give kind of quick, quick reports. Uh, I think okay. on the last item, it would be great if we could have time for Sherry to give a, a legal brief on it that y'all asked for. Okay. But the third item, there's two quick follow ups, and I'll hand it off if y'all ready to, to move on that uh, to, yes. to, to Doug. Uh, Commissioner Davenport asked a question about vehicle storage, uh, and he wanted to get a better idea of, of how that was a part of all of this related to home occupation ordinance review. So vehicle storage, <clears throat> okay, I may need to, John, are you still on the line? I'm still here. Okay, um, I can just say specifically, if it's not a, if it's a junk to vehicle, and by junk, the ordinance defines that as it's either not operable or not tagged currently. Um, you can't have those parked outside, um, but you can have those parked in a storage area. So if it's a vehicle someone's working on uh, that's not operable, it would need to be stored inside. 
John, do you know if there's a limit to the number currently? No. Is is this in relationship to the home occupation, though? Yes. Yes, it is. So specifically, uh, each business can have one one business vehicle um, at the residence uh, without a problem. Is that answer what you're looking for? I want to open Another up to Commissioner Davenport and see if that uh, adds the clarity you were looking for, sir, or if you had any follow-up questions. So, so the business, if they have a home occupation, um, the business can have that one car, but if it's, you know, three or four cars, that's not allowed. And what that's some correct. Of these if, if you're like a plumbing business and you have three or four plumbing trucks, that would not be allowed. Yeah. Um, if you're um, a landscaper, you can only have your your truck. You cannot have a bunch of equipment. Each each individual piece of equipment would be over the limit of one that you would be allowed to have. So you couldn't store your equipment at your house. Well, let's put a fine point on that. Number one, it's one vehicle, including a trailer. Number two, if you don't have a home occupation license, there you go. You can park your vehicles at your home, and there's no limit. Well, yeah, that's true. You can park your own vehicles at your home, but if we get a complaint that there's well, you a home can park occupation, your, you can. No, 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 no. I've been through this many times. If you do not have a home occupation license, you're not running your business from your home. You can park as many vehicles at your home that belong to your yeah. business as you wish. There's not no necessarily no commissioner yeah. that's not correct oh it is correct i've had that no problem. it's not i've had that problem for five years and now the problem you're the problem you're referring to sir is were un, unidentified vans that were parked at the residence that were not part of the didn't have any logos on them or anything like that so yeah. that those vehicles were allowed to park at the <laughs> residence that's so right. We're specifically talking about business vehicles they that, were, that are identified they are, as such. But they are business vehicles. They didn't, yeah, I they think didn't the issue them. is we, we couldn't prove that they were business vehicles because they didn't have the insignia of the business on them. I think the issue was he didn't have a whole occupation license. Therefore, he could park whatever he wanted there. Yeah. And, and this is Michael Petty from the attorney's office. And I agree with you, Commissioner Neesmith. That, that's correct. If there's not a home occupation office, there, then they can park vehicles. They just have to comply with our other ordinances. That's right. Parking ordinances and things like that. That's right. So this gets back to that essential problem we were having with this item was it the the hardest part about it is to make sure those that should have a home occupation license have one. And right. how do we right. make sure people are, are going through that process? Brad, did you have anything to add to this? I wanted to make sure. No, but I, I think that's been the <clears throat> that's been the quintessential issue since we started having this conversation months ago. And it's, I don't know that we have a good solution for it. If in most cases where there are violations that would be violations of the home occupation ordinance taking place, but they don't have a home occupation permit, they couldn't have gotten one anyway. So if they're claiming to be operating a business from another location, but three members of the family, all three work for the same company and all have take home vehicles, and the business is licensed somewhere else, there's nothing we can do about that. Right. <clears throat> that doesn't make it any better for the neighborhood, but that's, you know, we're now operating outside of, of the home occupation ordinance and under a different issue. Do we have any examples from other communities that have come up with a creative way of dealing with this kind of thing, or are they pretty much stymied like we have been? I've not, I've not done any research. Brad, you want to take that? Oh, I was just going to say, I haven't done any research from other communities related to that specifically. I mean, you generally get into that again from the standpoint of of parking. You know, we, you can't park in the grass. There are, there are those kind of restrictions. But on, sometimes on the larger lots, um, and certainly, you know, in the case of the issue that Commissioner Neesmith was talking about, you know, it was a large lot and, and a lot of room on the driveway to park vehicles. Commissioner Link, were you, were you talking there? I saw your mouth moving, but I couldn't hear you, Commissioner Link. You're on mute, Melissa. I wonder what the 
problem is, if, if the, the actual complaint is, is it that they're blocking the street, they're blocking the right of way and making, um, you know, the, the neighborhood streets dangerous? Or is it simply an aesthetic thing where people don't like the looks of commercial vehicles in their neighbor's driveway? Property values of their neighbor's homes because nobody wants to have buy a house with four trucks parked in the driveway all the time. It's a combination of both. Because we could, we could address, I mean, I, we, I've had problems with trailers blocking residential streets here in Boulevard where we do actually have some commercial property and we've had a trailer that's projecting into the street and there's not much you can do about it unless you um, designate some parking spaces. Um, so, I mean, I wonder if maybe we could take a look at our, some of our ordinances regarding neighborhood streets and come up with some prohibitions on, you know, with the vehicles parked on neighborhood streets and things like that. I mean, it doesn't hold back anything they do in their driveway, but it might at least address some of the problems you have with large vehicles and trailers on neighborhood streets that, that force people to walk in the streets and, you know, hamper right of -ways. I mean, I think one of the issues with dealing with that is that the state regulates the, you know, motor vehicles and local communities don't really have any say over it and they're public streets, you know, and, and unlike in some states like California, our license plates here don't say that it's a commercial vehicle. Michael, was there uh, anything you wanted to add to that or John, it looks like you might be trying to add. Something. Well, I mean, we certainly regulate parking so we if you if there was some sort of parking ordinance that we wanted to look at and we have a number of them like for vehicles can't park for more than 48 hours but you know there's there's they can't block traffic they can't be parked in the middle of the road they can't be parked out of spaces there there are a number of parking ordinances but um you know once we start getting into and there's actually an ordinance on our books about um large trucks but it has to do with the size like how much they weigh so I don't know if that's helpful. Well, and again, you know, we, we're running into it that, I mean, it, it's not an issue with the legitimate home occupation business because that ordinance specifically says that you cannot park your business related vehicles in the street. It's, it's the people that are not functioning under home occupation that have a bring home business vehicle that are not picked up under this home occupation section. And I don't know any way that we could pick them up under it. All right, so that's that's one sticky topic there. But the second piece to this, just to make sure we get your follow-ups in here uh, with with time allowances, we wanted uh, Doug prepared uh, some follow-up on the daycare uh, portion of this, which I think we might be ready to move forward with. Just make sure this is the right document I'm sharing here. So you should be able to see uh, what Doug's prepared related to daycare and single-family dwellings. Doug, you want to run us through this real quick? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. Um, basically, the code uh, classifies different uses of buildings, and the, the, the use that it classifies daycare as is either institutional or educational. But there's an exception in the code that says if the daycare is part of a single family dwelling and there's not more than five children, that it can be considered a single family dwelling use. So there's really no code changes that have to happen other than they have to get the proper licensing from the state to run a daycare with up to five children in their home. If we, now the state, th this is kind of confusing and I apologize for that. It, it confuses me every time I read it, but the state allows up to six in a single family home without triggering any of the fire marshal codes such as alarm systems and sprinklers and additional exiting and that kind of thing. So what we can do is we, we could increase it from four to five with no code changes. It would just take a text amendment to the zoning ordinance. If you wanted to take it to six, we can adopt an appendix in the international residential code that would allow for six. Um, and, and that would be easy to do, but it would trigger a couple of code requirements such as the fence in backyard, six foot high fence, and a couple other things that are not onerous on the owners. So that's kind of the options for us to be within code, uh, the building codes. 
I think that makes sense. So if we were to adopt up to six with these additional bullet points in the code, um, does that mean if you were to stick with with five or fewer, um, you wouldn't have to go these extra measures? Is that, is that the case? Yeah, that's exactly right. We could do five and the homeowners could have five children, you know, have their business licenses, their state licenses, and they wouldn't have to worry about this fencing requirement and these additional burdens. Uh, we're going to require smoke detectors anyway. That's not really an issue. So five, so once five, is, the, five is the cleaner route. Six would, would require us to adopt an amendment to our building code. Well, and, and just from a from a zoning standpoint, and this is in, this is new to me. I, this is interesting information, but I mean, generally, the intent of that home occupation ordinance has always been to allow somebody to operate a limited business within their home. Again, with it first and foremost being the home without the need to make any type of modification to that facility to meet local ordinances, or in this case, state ordinances. Five continues that. If we were to go to six, we've now got a one specific home occupation use that if you say six, then there's going to be a need to make modifications to your house. And they're not significant, but- There's still, there's still a modification to there's the There's still modifications. I, I would really prefer five if you guys can get comfortable with it. I think I'm it's totally comfortable. I'm totally so comfortable. My question is, um, you know, if someone were to go to six, I mean, is, is there an option? If you, if you sure. offer the home occupation at just five, you don't make these modifications. But if you want to go to the six, you have to make these modifications. Well, so basically two levels well, of HO well, this? No, no, because I think our philosophy is that anything that requires a modification to the home uh, it, it does not comply with the whole spirit of the home occupations. License. Yeah, but these are really minor modifications. These are like kind of normal stuff that you do if you have kids around in your house. You know, well, well, um, a guardrail on your porch if it's more than 12 inches high. You know. Yeah, but these, these, these are like required. These are codes that but, most people have in their homes. These are required changes, though. Yeah, but they're like not optional. They're well, they're not um, they're not characteristic of commercial buildings. They they're completely falling in line with characteristics of residential. Maybe homes. not. Maybe not. Uh, can I ask Doug? Um, so I mean, uh, the reason I think it is all, it's important for us to go to six, and the reason that I, I brought this forward to the mayor is because I actually heard from some in-house uh, daycare providers, daycare providers, and they were talking about that it's limited at four and, 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 and four is, it makes it almost impossible to actually make enough money to make it worthwhile to actually provide in-house childcare, center, especially at a quality level. And that five might make, help that somewhat, but the specific ask where the six to get it up to where the state is, where other cities are able to, and some of these providers are able to offer a higher level of quality of child care because um, it's more cost effective and what i wonder though about this and, and these requirements here have we run and compared these requirements to the requirements necessary by the state to actually be a registered because i actually think that most of these things are already required by the state to be a child care provider you know that's a good point commissioner these may be required i, I can't imagine that if you use your yard as part of the daycare that you wouldn't have to have it secured with a fence. So I, I can check on that. Um, but I think six is fairly common in the state. Uh, we're, we're really careful locally to adhere to the codes that are adopted. And so that's why I said, if we went to six, I would really want to adopt um, Appendix M. And I do, Commissioner um, Link is right. They're not major changes. Um, I think what Brad and Commissioner Neesmith were talking about was the original intent of the home occupation was just to be able to operate your business as is. What this would do would trigger a fence permit, possibly, unless the fence is already there and complies. And then it may it may require you to put a guardrail on a low deck that wouldn't normally require one. So it's totally up to you guys. It's doable either way. Right, and, and I guess, and to do that, like, so I understand, uh, like, Commissioner Neesmith's uh, comment that, like, the intent of this is to keep it, that you can operate out of your home, but this operation, specifically for daycare, is already different, that it has a, set, a separate set of requirements from the state, 
So I think going ahead and making these changes for six um, is not going to be burdensome because the burden is already present and presented by the state. Um, and the I think the argument of saying that the original intent is kind of mute here because again, these are there's other requirements from the state to operate this kind of business. So I think that we should go ahead and go full on adopt the amendment that we need and and have this be for six. I agree. Well, um, well, and I, I think that, you know, these are just basic safety requirements anyways, that you'd want somebody who was taking care of children to have in their home, whether there were six or four there. Well, Jerry, let, me just, let me just make the point again that we, the state doesn't require these fences or fence and the rails for up to five. The state does require it for six. I don't so, think that's correct, Jerry. I think that's exactly what he said, but who can correct me if I'm wrong? No, that, well, what I was referring to is our building code, um, which may differ slightly from the state uh, early learning department. I can't think of the exact name of that. I, I, I thought I heard, and maybe I didn't hear it right, but what I thought I heard you say was that the, state's re the state requirements had a set of requirements for up to five, but for six or more, there were more stringent requirements, which included a six foot fence. Okay, um, so the five came from the building code. It says if, if you if you have no more than five children in a daycare, then you can just still consider it a single family home. Right, but then the state says if you have six, you have to have a fence. The building code does, yes, sir. Oh, it's our building code, it's not the state. Well, it's a, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a code adopted by the state. Okay. That, that's why it may be that I need to do a little more research and see how other county jurisdictions are handling this. I think it's just they simply adopt the appendix. Right. Well, but, well how about this? Since there seems to be some confusion and since it's nearly seven o'clock, why don't we ask for a clarification on um, the issue that's come up vis a vis five versus six um, and bring this back up next time we meet? And, um, if I could get a clarification, I'm assuming when we're talking about, for example, five, as it is at the moment, five or fewer children, that's five or fewer at any given time. Correct? That's, that's correct. Okay. It's, right. It's the maximum of five at, at a given time. Yes, sir. Okay. So, so if we have a, somebody that has childcare in their home and they were to have, let's say, five children in the morning and a different five in the afternoon, what happens at crossover time when they've technically maybe got 10 children in their residence at the same time? Uh, well, that's a good, I don't really have an answer for that other than uh, you could probably just consider that crossover time and not care time. I, I don't know really. That may be, okay. We can look at that as well. well. I mean, the zoning, okay, I call Michael and Sherry and ask them. <laughs> the, the language okay. in the zoning ordinance for home occupations for daycare says no more than four under the care, no more than four individuals under care at a time, excluding family members' children. So I would say the crossover is going to create a problem with the way that it's worded in our local ordinance right now. Uh -huh. So maybe we specify in the local ordinance that um, there is a lag time if there is a if they do a, a double shift that you know pick up is say at noon and the next set of kids doesn't get dropped off till twelve thirty. So there. from uh, I mean from having to very recently research this whole thing and look into it, that's not a common practice with child care providers. There's not shifts like that usually. Um, it's just because. I mean, every once in a while, you'll have, you'll have some people who do drop-ins. There's the drop-in services. Um, and I think that would be that you couldn't have more than whatever the set number is at that time, including for drop-in. Um, but on this whole thing, and I, I feel like we've done a really good job of focusing on the technical aspects and the code aspects of this, I would really like us to be able to pull in um, Clayton Adams, who is the head of DECAL for this region, who can also who can answer all these questions that we're talking about right here. It can also talk about what the uh, the regulations are for um, uh, for uh, the Georgia licensing standards um, and how the overlaps with this, and also talk about the the more the community need aspect, which I don't think has really been brought up. 
So I'd love to have uh, him and any other experts on this kind of brought into it. Okay, so for the purposes of moving us along, I'm going to suggest that we come back to this at our next meeting. If we could have the person that Tim just mentioned come and talk to us, and if we could get some clarification on the questions we had um, about crossover time and about uh, five versus six children. Does that sound reasonable? Yes. Will do. Okay. Are we happy with that? Yep. Yes. All right. So finally, I think our attorneys, uh, one of our attorneys was just going to give us a quick update on um, the last item on our agenda. Of course. So uh, let me know if you can't hear me again, but uh, I sent out a memo um, that Judd and I worked on regarding the Minority Business Enterprise uh, question, program question. The short version is that there's a Supreme Court case that's pretty much directly on the board city of... You're fading in and out, Sherry. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't know why. As I can. All right. Um, there's a, a case called City of Richmond versus J.A. Croson that's cited in the in the report, the memo. And the short version is that you generally can't do any sort of minority or gender-based programs unless you can prove that you have a documented verifiable history of discriminating against those specific groups and that you're trying to address that. Um, it's, it's really a hard sell, I think, and the courts are very concerned because it's just so easy for race-based programs to be, uh, I guess, improperly used. Um, so, so anyways, I, I tried to detail that uh, pretty extensively in the memo. I'm happy to answer any questions that you all may have about it. Oh, just to clarify, clarify, when you say you have to have a documented history, are you talking about the local government or are you talking about the community as a whole? Uh, ideally, the local government. Um, okay. or, or, for instance, as in this case, if we could say that there was a history of, for example, um, like a construction like large construction corporations specifically discriminating against a specific minority, then we might be able to set up a program to address that for that specific minority. Are, not are for we all able, minorities. Are we able to give preference to local businesses? So I did check that, and yes, we can do local businesses. Okay. Um, the, the, the proposal, the solution really is to focus, uh, to set up a program Sort perhaps similar to the one that Macon has that focuses on small local businesses, not yeah. minority or gender based restrictions. Right. I mean, I think that's that'll probably do it. <laughs> well, just to follow up on uh, or Commissioner Neesmith, um, several years ago, there was a committee that looked at giving preference to local businesses in, in our uh, contracting, and it's a bit more complicated than it might seem off the top of our heads and um, the committee at that time decided that there were more negatives than there were positives. It might be worth digging that report out and circulating it amongst the committee. I think it may even have been under Mayor, Dance, uh, Mayor um, Davison, I can't remember now, um, but I remember it was, I think it was in LRC, um, but uh, Gene, you know, the font of all information will probably know where that is, but yeah. But it, it, they, it, we spent a lot of time looking at this and at the end of the day decided that at least at that time having a local preference or uh, ordinance was not what we wanted wanted to do now maybe the environment has changed maybe people's desire has changed but it, this is not um, you know this is not a new topic that we've addressed okay well let's look at it um, so if I, I, I guess I have one first comment and say is that I, I don't think uh, supporting local businesses gets the intent of what we're discussing here at, at all. Um, this was very specifically based around uh, minority businesses and what we were, and the conversation that started this was specifically around, uh, you know, black and brown business owners, um, which uh, I, th I feel that if we were to go just on the local routes, um, 
you have the same you have the same exact uh, inequality happening just on a local level. Um, and so my my question then would be uh, 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 to you, Sherry. Um, and do do we know um, any cities? And I'm sorry, I haven't read through the entire report, but any cities that have uh, successfully been able to uh, to reach that 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 marker of uh, establishing that there was like you know uh, a grave injustice to specific races or. So I'm not aware of any that have gone through that. I think what I what is heard to say is that it all depends on if you're challenged. I mean, there's nothing in the law that says we can't pass a minority business enterprise program, but I think we should expect very quickly to be sued if we do, and then we would have to demonstrate why we have the ability to do that. And this Croson case is um, city of Richmond case is just has so many steps, and you can see the thinking of the Supreme Court. Uh, and so it, it just makes it very unlikely that we would be successful. I know Durham has a, a program. I will mm-hmm. also say, I, I think it's helpful to know that when Macon put in their program and Judd was, was there, they brought in an expert who specifically puts these together um, to kind of walk them through that process. So I, I think to, to Commissioner Harrod's point, it was a very involved process um, and not an easy thing to set up, even, even on a completely gender and race neutral small business program. There are communities that are doing it, though. Is the answer? Okay. Yeah. Well, let me let me argue in Georgia. Yeah. No, I don't think there. Well, I think Atlanta has something similar, but Atlanta has some different uh, things, and also a very powerful legal department. Um, I mean, the reality is that there's just a lot of litigation in Athens. I mean, we've been sued on over stormwater and all sorts of other things that are not particularly litigious in other. So we should definitely Tim, expect a challenge. Yeah, Tim, bear with me here a moment while I explain what what my my, my perspective is. Number one, if if we if we ha- if we have a, a preference for uh, minority owned businesses, um, we're pro- we may be trying to trying to resolve and, and fix the problems of the whole country here and having no real benefit to our citizens. Um, if if we could have a small, if we could have a local business preference. I think I think that will have a, a good effect on minority on minority owned businesses that are local, and maybe even encourage them uh, to pursue uh, a business that's local, but encourage minorities to pursue lo- a local business enterprise. So, I have a, a question or an idea. Um, you know, so legally we can't necessarily do a minority business preference, but could we institute minority business programming that maybe offers um, some training and things like that, um, some some inside information? Because from what I understand, the hardest part for some of these businesses is just getting their foot in the door. They sure. don't have the, the social connections to know, and, and, and they don't have the experience behind them to even be considered. Mm-hmm. So if there was a program to give them that foot in the door and to give them a little bit of experience and some of those connections be considered. So Commissioner Link, uh, staff uh, spent some time brainstorming and I attached uh, the, the flow chart that shows the RFP process to kind of prove your, <laughs> to prove your point that like, this is a challenging process for residents to navigate. And so uh, staff is on the line. Uh, Jessica, our purchasing administrator, already jumped in an earlier item and, and Crystal Coburn, our, our inclusion officers on the line, they spent some time together brainstorming uh, short-term opportunities like that. Uh, and, and if y'all want to spend five minutes, they could share some of their ideas and, and, and we can uh, end it at that and share more next meeting. But uh, they're on the line if you want to hear some of their ideas. That would be sure. Fun. All right, Chris, Crystal and Jessica, I'll give you the floor. Okay, so um, one of the things we did is sort of start thinking through, as Josh mentioned, what's the existing procurement process and what might be some of the barriers to um, increased participation. So one thing we could do is find ways to provide tip to tail human support. Um, Both Toro and Jessica in finance noted that when vendors are actually able to ask questions and have multiple conversations and get in-person support, it helps them stay in the pipeline and get into the pipeline. 
Um, in more than one instance, a vendor has been able to successfully compete for a bid after getting insight from Toro around how to effectively complete and strengthen their quote. Um, and as Josh mentioned earlier in this call, um, Durham has two staff members specifically dedicated to contracting. Um, so one thing that we could do to start would be to explore practical ways to increase human support throughout the process um, and provide that from the very, very beginning. And that includes proactive outreach. So finding ways to make the process as accessible and transparent as possible, not expecting people to come find the process, but instead taking programming out into our communities. So the essential action step there would be to expand our capacity to meet people where they are and provide real human support at every single stage of the procurement application process. Um, the second thing we could do is adapt our language. So we could use easy to understand language. The language that we currently have um, can be extremely difficult to understand, as Josh just pointed out, just looking at the process. Um, so one of the things that finance is currently doing to help support potential vendors um, is taking the time to break things down in those sort of face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, this is connected to the tip-to-tail human support that we just talked about, but by actively and systemically simplifying the language and refining the process, finding ways to streamline it, we can help to make sure that more vendors actually understand the requirements and the steps that are involved and that more vendors, again, get into and stay in that pipeline. So the potential action step there would be to identify all existing procurement documents, requirements, and processes, and begin the process of simplifying and streamlining proactively. Uh, and third thing that we could do, uh, Jessica and Toro mentioned that we have in the past done expos in combination with UGA. It's essentially like a reverse trade show where there are tables that you know UGA departments and ACC Gov um, puts on and vendors can come and find out what it would take to be able to bid for opportunities to work with those various departments. So if we were to put on a similar expo when public health allows or even find a way possibly to do this virtually, um, it could provide an opportunity to give hands-on support. If we were to bake in sort of like a session on site, um, and we again could do this virtually, where we are breaking down the steps that are involved, sort of really explaining here's how you can be as competitive as possible as we take the other steps outlined above, the tip to tail human support and the easy to understand language, um, we may be able to target some of the goals that you've mentioned. That, that's exactly what I was uh, imagining. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I look at this chart and I don't know what the hell I'm looking at. And, you know, I theoretically kind of understand this stuff. Um, I'm thinking about small businesses who wouldn't even this would send them running screaming. Um, and I also think ab about, um, you know, small businesses who might want to expand, but are be huddled, befuddled by our planning process. Um, you know, it's not that easy to find out what kind of businesses are allowed in certain zones. Um, so I would say, if, you know, if we move forward with this kind of handholding process, we take a look at our, our planning process as well. <laughs> Would it be possible, um, Crystal, to just get maybe like a one-page write-up of what you just said that we can, so we know, A, what we're doing, and B, some of the possibilities of, or some of the improvements that you're talking, you're off, you and your office are talking about doing? Yes. Because I think that would be helpful. Yeah, definitely. Good, pla good place to start. Yeah. And, and yeah. Jessica, was there... Bullet points on, on major suggestions and just Gosh. jessica was there anything you wanted to add to to what crystal shared i know y'all worked on that together but i wanted to make sure there was anything else um we did uh the only other thing that um and i can't remember if it came up at the time that crystal and i spoke or not but you know um there's always the potential that you could do um classes of how to do business with ACC or um, just general class to go over the language in the document. Right. And, All right, so we'll work on getting that uh, one pager back to you. Sherry, thanks for all your work on the legal brief. And, and uh, Crystal and Jessica, thanks for all your work on brainstorming. And, and we can okay. get you uh, more information and, and figure out what y'all want for the next meeting.
Sure. So, I so want to follow up if I really can. I just want to, because I know, Commissioner Link, your original question was about minority programs to assist. I just want to make it really clear that equal protection is important. So uh, it, it's best to make these general programs that are available to everyone. Yeah. But we could certainly do the kind of um, community outreach that often isn't done to specifically to minority communities. I think as long as we're as long as we're doing outreach to everyone, then I think that's acceptable. Um, we can talk about that more. It's just okay. we've we got to make sure we treat similarly situated people the same. Okay. Well, let's. Um, we're now nearly at two hours, so um, let's. Uh, Josh, could we maybe send, or could your office maybe send out a doodle for a month or so for our next meeting? Now that we seem to have mastered virtual meetings, um, we'll do. And um, does anybody else have any anything else they desperately want to say? If not, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll move. Do we have a second? Second. Any more discussion? All right, if not, everybody in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? All right, thank you very much, and we'll wait to hear from Josh. All right, thanks, y'all. Thank you.